Runners only with Dom Harvey. Runners only with Dom Harvey and um, evidently an old friend of mine, Penny Taylor. Hello. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> You're good. This is slightly <laughs> awkward. We just established that we're like old mates from Palmy North. You, you were good friends with my girlfriend, Kim. I was. Yeah. Yeah, right through, right through school, yeah. Went to your first house. Well, I, I'm a I'm a piece of shit. I don't remember, and I'm sorry. It's a, a, lot, a million years ago, yeah, though, Dom. It is wonderful to have you around here on the podcast. Uh, we follow each other on Instagram. I've been inspired by you. I know a, a lot of people that'll be listening to this or watching this will be like, I, I don't know who Penny Taylor is, um, and if that's you, I urge you to stick around because it's a it's a hell of a ride. So it sure is. It's hard to know where to start. Buckle up. Hey, buck- <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been your reality for like the last 14 years. And I, I wonder, this is the first time you've gone on a podcast. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, like, how does it make you feel when you tell the story? Um, sometimes, like one-on-one, I'm really good. I can just tell the story. To a big crowd, I get emotional, which is weird. Um, and I've never really, I've always shied away, really. I haven't really talked about it that much. Mm. I'm okay with it, um, but just have really put all my energy and focus into recovery yeah. and surviving those first few years and now thriving. Yeah, oh, it's, it's so inspirational. The, the getting emotional in a big room thing, do you think that's because you sort of feed off the energy of the crowd? You see the, the emotion that they're going through and... You sort of feed yeah, off that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's just something weird. Like, I know other people that can stand up and talk about their stories, like, really confidently, and I admire them, but it's just not something I can do, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's get into the story that we're talking about. Um, take us back to 36-year-old Penny Taylor in November 2009. Yep. So, I was um, a single mum, so I had Sam who was seven and who is now 20, um, and Jade was three and who is now 17. Um, and so we were just, you know, it was November, it was a busy time at work, it was also a social time at work, you know, with Christmas, Christmas parties, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, and, um, yeah, we did have a function on the Saturday night for work. Um, was completely fine, didn't overdo it, you know. Too, too, too badly. <laughs> oh, come on, you're, you're, from, you're from Palmerston North. We, we were swimming in the, the same waters. Yeah. A, a, a palmy girl not overdoing it. That's yeah. a couple of bottles of wine. Yeah, that's it. And we finished <laughs> off at the dirty old cob. You know what nice. that's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so then the next few days went by. Um, and then on the Thursday morning, I woke like really early, about five o'clock in the morning, and um, just felt nauseous and was, gonna, and was just vomiting. And so I was dragging myself to the toilet, vomiting, going back to bed. Um, I had the kids at home with me. Um, I did manage to text their dad and say, could you pick them up and take them to school? Because I don't think I'll be doing that today. Mm. So he was good. He came around, picked them up, did what he needed to do with them. Um, He did realise that he thought I didn't look that good. Um, And he did alert my mum and said that um, he'd been around, picked the kids up, didn't know how well... Penny actually was at that point in time so to me all I'd had was vomiting so um, as the day went on I just continued to be in and out and sleeping vomiting sleeping vomiting basically Um, four o'clock in the afternoon my mum finishes work and I'm resilient for and I just have to lock the door. Like, I never not lock my front door. It's just a thing I've always done. And for whatever reason this day, I, whether Jason didn't lock it on his way out or um, I don't know how, but it was unlocked. Jeez, where, where do you live in, Pummy? Like, Highbury, Tackle? <laughs> <laughs> you would think so, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't uh, know. For anyone that doesn't know their geography, they're, they're like the bad areas yeah, of yeah, Palmer, yeah. Mr North. Yeah. Um, And so, fortunately, it wasn't locked. So, my mum finished work. She came by, um, came in, and I was unconscious at that point. And um, she was trying to raise my, you know, alertness, and she couldn't couldn't get anything from me. I don't remember her arriving at all. Um, And so, So sorry, I'm just going to pause you there. So, in the space of like 12 hours, you went from 
the start of like what you assumed was like a flu or a virus. So or it was like five in the morning yeah. that I first noticed feeling unwell, and this was four in the afternoon. Yeah, eleven hours later. Yeah. So what I put it down to as a vomiting only was I'd picked up a bug from the kids. Like Jade was at daycare and Sam was at school, so you know, well, like everything chance. home. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I had thought, but by the time Mum had got to me, say around four thirty, I think it was, um, I was incoherent and I don't remember her arriving um so because she couldn't raise you know anything from me she rung the ambulance they turned up um I have no recollection of this at all um mom said when they put me into the ambulance they had alerted the hospital that it was like code four or whatever it was um they had given me half an hour to live by the time I arrived um, and mum said on my way to the hospital, there, she noticed a black spot on my leg. And then by the time I got to the hospital, the black spot had grown all the way up my leg and was basically taking over my body, which was... Well, just like your limbs dying. Yeah, so that's the meningococcal. Right. Um, so once... So literally they, they threw me into A&E. Um, everyone was gowned up from head to toe with the big, like, white masks, everything. Um, so you, you remember this, or you just yeah, these you are things were told that I've this. been told. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they tried. So they quickly realised that it was meningococcal, um, and they quickly tried all the normal drugs that they would give you to do that, to try and s- slow that progress down. Um, I was well too far gone by that stage. Um, so then they put me up to ICU. Um, and I remember mum saying that the doctor had told her to take me, like to the nurse, take me straight up. I needed to get on the machines and they were dilly dallying around and this doctor let rip apparently because of the time was so crucial. Yeah. Um, so we got up to ICU in Palmerston North Hospital and um, I was literally strapped to everything known to mankind. Um, at that point they um, had given me so by the time they stretched me all up, they realised the extent of it all. So all my organs had failed. So my liver, my kidneys, everything internally um, was failing at a rapid rate. And I had a temperature of 42 degrees. So I was literally frying from the inside. What's it, what's it supposed to be? 36, 37 okay. is yeah. normal. Yeah. Um, so with that, so like literally my body's just been taken over by this virus. Um, I swelled up to twice the size of me. So I was kind of really unrecognisable. I'd, it just had ballooned out. Um, so they put me all on the ventilators, etc. cetera. Um, and then one of the doctors just went away and just started researching. He realised I was 36 years old. He realised I had a young family. He's like, we need to do something. So he rang around all the hospitals in New Zealand to ask what drugs they had used for meningococcal B case. So I was meningococcal B. What does that mean? It's the different variant of okay, it. Right. So the most common is like the W, which was up in Northland. Like there was a big mess um, they did a big vaccination program up there because it was taking over some of the schools. Okay. Um, but B was one they didn't have a vaccine for, um, and they have now created it from my records. Um, but yeah, so they so they ventilated me, put me into an, a coma. Um, sort of said to my mum and dad and everyone that I would they protecting forty eight to seventy two hours. And that's it. People that need to come and say goodbye need to come up. Oh, so you were you were basically on life support. Yeah. Um, oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you you don't remember any of this, though, no. right? No, none of it at all. I have no idea what the family, what everyone else went through. I can ima- only imagine. That's um, harrowing. Yeah. That's harrowing. Yeah. Uh, um, just you just just pausing pausing here before we move on. It's such a. I mean, there, there, there's. Well, spoiler alert, you survived. I you're, did. you're here now on the podcast. <laughs> There's so much to be thankful for, like the, I don't know, the hunch or the intuition or whatever it was from your ex to like get in touch with your mum. Like, there's so much that did go right. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you would have just died there in bed, presum- presumably. I would have, yeah. A couple of hours later. A couple of hours later, yeah. That 100%, they said that that, that would have been the end. Um, I would have been found. Because you hear about those stories, don't you, with people that have contracted meningococcus and they've woken up 
they haven't woken the mm. next day, um, gone to bed thinking it's a cold or a flu and not woken up. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the difference with me is that I didn't have any of those other symptoms. So all the other ones that they say is like, you know, the lights, you know, your eyes are painful with looking at light, um, the headaches, the runny nose, all those fever type thing. I never had that. Mm. I just had the vomiting. That was it. Yeah. How, how do you how do you catch at it? How can you avoid it? So everyone carries it. So everyone has it in the back of their throat, and it's just so you could be a carrier and never pass it on, um, and never get sick yourself, or you could be a carrier and pass it on. And so saliva based, obviously, with being in the back of your throat and. Um, it can be as simple as picking up someone else's cup or sharing a drink and you have left your saliva on there with the um, disease and I've picked it up and it's taken over my body. It can be as easy as that. Young girls with lip gloss, sharing that. Um, and that's why it was so um, heavy in the young kids, like little preschool children because they put everything in their mouths mm. <laughs> so it takes over yeah, all the yeah, time yeah, yeah. and then also teenagers in university hostels mm. so for me to be 36 was a little bit out of the box yeah. um, and then after me there were quite several a lot of several cases of people um, in the same age bracket that were getting it so it then kind of was discovered that it not necessarily is it in those two age groups mm. anymore. So what what can people do to avoid it? Is there anything in that, that we can do? Don't share drinks. Okay. Yeah. Don't yeah. just be really conscious about what you do. So um, my kids, it was drummed into them at a very young age not to share yeah. anything. Um, you always tell your kids to share, but don't do it in this <laughs> way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's just... It's just, it's one of those things, really. Mm. You can't actually do a lot to prevent it. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it just seems like it's a bad luck or a bad roll of the dice, really, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so you're, um, you're on life support and intensive care unit at Palmerston North Hospital. Um, you, your mum would have told you this, I'm guessing. Did, did, did they come in and say goodbyes and things like that? Yeah, so um, they had to bring the kids up. Um, so and your kids were? Three and seven. Oh. So they had to try and explain. So Jade doesn't, she was three, she doesn't really remember a lot, but I think Sam does more, he was seven. Um, and of course I didn't look like mum because I'd swollen, I was mm. like filling the hospital bed and I just didn't look like me. So I don't really know I, don't, I haven't even really asked how well that went because I don't really want to know because I can only imagine that it would have been heartbreaking. Yeah, you know. How old's your son now? Twenty. He's twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever talk about it or no? You just yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah we talk about it. A, yeah, we do talk about it over the years, and they know exactly how lucky they are to have me still here. Mm. Um, Suppose that, that makes it less triggering. Uh, I mean, if, if if that was his last vision of you, it's the sort of thing that would give you PTSD. Yeah. But the fact that you've um, you survived it and you are thriving, as you said before, and you've an incredible role model for them, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Know, yeah. That sort of takes away the sting of that hospital visit. Yeah, that's it. So, um, yeah, so I don't really, I don't think that, I don't know how well that went, but yeah, then I just had like all my nearest and dearest obviously came in and um, saw me. Um, in the meantime, the doctor that was ringing around the hospitals um, came back to mum and dad with this drug and don't ask me what the name is because I can't remember. <laughs> um, but it was really left field. So one of my other friends, Kelly, um, she was a nurse. And so um, she was kind of there alongside mum and dad, putting it into normal terms for them to try and understand what they're talking about. Um, so Kelly said it, it is pretty random. It's not a drug that they... No one else had used it and it's not a drug that they would have... Um, used normally mm. but mum and dad said well it's worth a shot try anything like right? let's just do yeah. it so they shipped it in over the course of the weekend so this was a Thursday night I was admitted and so they started shipping it in on the Friday um, the doctor that shipped it in went on leave on the Saturday and Sunday and he didn't expect to see me on Monday that when he left on Friday he thought I wouldn't be there so they started administrating this drug and by the Sunday afternoon I did a teaspoon of wheeze which they all celebrated and were <laughs> jumping around because that proved to them that my kidneys were starting to do something. And so even though it was only a teaspoon, but it was... How, how, right did, they, how, did, they, how did they even know? Were they like monitoring your, your, 
everything. Your bowels and your bladder. And, yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. You, you're like, honestly, I was hooked up to so many machines. It was, yeah, I've seen photos um, of it. And, um, yeah, I was, yeah, there was no, there wasn't much room for anything else. I was jabbed everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that indication of the teaspoon of wheeze was like, okay, Massive. we're heading in a, in a good direction. Still, obviously, very critical. I was still in a coma. Um, so they just kept administrating it over the course of the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, as I think it was about a month uh, in a coma, they decided that they would start to bring me out. Um, I hadn't died so they were like okay let's bring her out and see what happens um because of all the internal organ organs failing so I was on dialysis for my kidneys um and then so that was going 24 7 um they didn't know how I was going to be because I didn't have any when people talked to me I would say things way way back in the past but not in the present. Oh, this is when you just came out of the COVID. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you remember any of this now? Or? So I have some vivid experiences of coming out of a coma. Yeah. And I, yeah, it was, it's horrific. Like they say hallucinations and it's seriously, it's horrible. Um, and like the, what? Well, there was, I, I know I remember this. So there was, um, so they had start. so over the course of three days, they're bringing me out of this coma and they had to do it very slowly. They thought that possibly I might be a little bit brain damaged because of the temperature that I had. Um, fortunately, I'm not. But um, so I, I guess heading towards the end of coming out, um, that's when the halluc hallucination started. And I just had this vivid feeling that people were chasing me and they wanted to kill me and it was vivid like so vivid and um to the point where in ICU you don't have to have the side of the beds up because patients generally aren't going to go anywhere mm. when you're in ICU um but these were so vivid the power of the mind I, at one point, I literally, I lifted my body attached to all of those machines and I threw myself on what I thought was a wheelchair. So I knew that I couldn't walk, but I threw myself onto a wheelchair thinking I could get away from this person that was chasing me. I sound like a nutcase, <laughs> but it was seriously. Um, is this, is this, the, is this the, the drugs you're on? Yeah. Or? Yeah, it's the drugs of yeah. coming out of the coma. Yeah, and got to get a hold of some of them. Yeah, no, no, it was <laughs> no, not. No. It was not pleasant. <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and then I just I landed in a heap on the floor. So of course everyone in ICU were like mortified. They had never seen that happen before in their life that someone that was in a coma could do that. Mm. Um, so then they had to put me through the machines to make sure I hadn't broken anything. Um, and now, I dare say it, that ICU, they have the side rails up now. Because <laughs> oh, they, they changed the rules changed because the of you. Rules. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. So, um, yeah, so that, that was horrific. It was like not... So how long? How long did those hallucinations... It felt like forever. Yeah. It felt like forever for me. I don't know how long it actually was, but it just felt horrendous. Um, so when in my grogginess, um, you know, I was saying really random things to family and stuff. Some some things made sense, some things didn't. So that's where they were really dicey about whether my brain was mm. actually going to function or not. Yeah. Um, so I guess after a course of about a month, um, they were trying to, because I needed dialysis, and I also needed to have my legs looked at because I looked like I had frostbite. Oh, yeah, so you still had all your limbs at this point? Yeah. yeah. So I hadn't had any surgeries whatsoever because I wasn't well enough to, to endure yeah, any sure. surgeries. So, um, yeah, so you see frost, frostbite, and that's mm. what I looked like. I was black, like literally black all over. Um, fortunately, my face didn't get affected, um, but yeah, fingers, hands. Um, torso? No, torso no. was fine, but my arms are all scarred. And my <clears throat> oh, they are. Yeah, and my legs. What's this? What's the scarring on those arms from? So that's where the meningococcal ate away in my body. Yeah, and so then. Oh, so it just sort of like eats away at the flesh. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So that's what the meningococcal does. And then, of course, when your organs fail, you then go into septus. And so then I went into septicemia, and that's when you that's when it starts to go gangrene-looking, and that's when your limbs become affected. So, yeah. Oh, man, this and is that, terrifying. And that turnaround happens really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, so um, so is it is it obvious to you that you're going to lose the limbs, or are you just not thinking about anything at that? I point? hadn't even registered. Yeah, like no. You're just in a state of bewilderment, so you don't yeah. know what's going on. I hadn't, had no idea what what had happened. I had no idea how long I'd been in hospital for, um, and I knew that I was sick, but I didn't because I was pinned to the bed by that. I had no idea what what everything looked like, um, and so. They were trying to – so that I needed dialysis and I needed to have basically my legs amputated. And at that stage they were thinking they might be able to just do my feet, but it really depends how far they – what they what they think of. Um, and then um, – So is, is that a decision that you make or is it a decision your mum makes on your behalf? No, or? it's a decision that the doctors make. So they It's just like a, not no choice in the matter, it just nah. has to be. Yeah. So they basically had to go up up my leg till they reached some decent amount of yeah. flesh, skin, you know, everything that looked like would be able to be healed. So I remember them saying to me, so so this went on for a while, and then in the end I remember saying to the doctor, look, do, can we just make a decision and get this thing going because I'm just like lurking around here. <laughs> um, and what they were trying to do was they were trying to get me to be transferred to Waikato Hospital because their dialysis and their plastics unit, et cetera, were all in within the one hospital. Yeah. But because I was in Palmerston, I had to go, my region for that sort of thing was Wellington. So I had to go to the lower heart burns unit. Um, and that meant I had to endure a trip into Wellington Central Hospital for the dialysis. So it was in two separate hospitals. Oh. And it was oh, horrendous. Yeah. Um, so they were trying to avoid that situation, but they couldn't. Waikato wouldn't take me. So I had to go down. So they flew me down to um, Lower Hutt and they treated me like a Burns patient. So when you had Kelsey on the other week and I listened to her story about the Burns and Oh, yeah, she, this, this is Kelsey Waghorn, yeah. her, the White Island survivor. Yeah. yeah. I resonated with her mm. so much because the treatment that she had was very similar to mine. Yeah. Obviously, hers was a lot more um, over her body, but um, it was the same kind of treatment. So I was put into the burns unit, and then I luckily, to my, I'm so grateful I went there now. At the time, wasn't, but now I'm so grateful um, because I ended up with Dr. Swede Tan, who was a really excellent plastic surgeon. Yeah, cool. Um, and he was able to, he said to my mum, I, we might, we'll try for the feet, but we all just have to go up as far as we can. But if we can do anything, we would love to be able to save her knees because as a bilateral amputee, having knees is going to make life so much easier for her. So, um, so all this is happening and you're blissfully unaware. Blissfully unaware. Yeah. 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 Which is probably a good thing. Yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> it, I mean, the, yeah. The, it's, a, it's interesting, eh? there's two ways of looking at it, I guess. Cause I, I had a, another remarkable woman on the podcast last year called Rachel Meyer, who's um, a, a para climber. And she had an accident um, when, she was kid and bro- uh, when she was a kid and broke some um, bones in her foot. And she ended up opting to have um, her leg removed as, yeah. a, as an adult. So she went through the whole grieving process of like farewelling it and making this decision and coming to that decision, but that wasn't even a, an option for you. No, no option. So no, the, it was more about survival. Yeah. So they had to get they had to do it to f- in order for me to live. Yeah. That, that was where it was at. Yeah. So they um my literally my mum and dad, like the family had to say goodbye to me again at that point because it was a twelve hour surgery to do the amputations and they the state that I was in they didn't think I would come out of it oh my god your your poor parents I know oh my god I, I mean we'll, we'll, we'll get to we'll get to the, the the horrible stuff that you went through on the road to recovery afterwards I yeah. mean yeah but but meanwhile you're blissfully unaware of all this shit that's going on your poor mother I know oh yeah. my god put it put them all through yeah, so I, I, and I can't think imagine that's what a roller. How long was this roller coaster for that they were on? Of she might make it, she might not. Um, this is happening. She might not make this. Yeah, so this was like four weeks down the track, and then I was three weeks in Wellington while they did all the surgeries. Um, Who's looking after the kids at this time? Just the ex- so they were all down. Okay. Everyone was down in Wellington. Yeah. Jason had brought them um, down as well, so he was really awesome and supported yeah. everybody in that way. Um, 
And then, yeah, so I went into the surgery. Um, Swede Tan managed to basically patch quilt my legs to be able to keep my... So they were scrapping around trying to find some skin. So they um, had to take skin from all sorts of places to try and be able to do all my arms and my legs with where the manager cockle had eaten in them away and then also try and amputate my legs and then patch them up with skin. So like, like from a skin graft or yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I got grafted from my back and my and my torso, um, which was probably more painful than the other areas because it's like a graze and it's horrible. Um but I owe my knees to him because he did whatever he could to save them and I'm so grateful for that because having your knees is so much more functional than mm. being above knee. It's like lot, a lot, lot harder. Um, so then over the course of those three weeks, I was in and out. Like, So I would endure literally nearly two surgeries a day while they were ch- either checking my grafts to make sure they're taking um, or going in and doing the next lot. Um, and then in between times, they would come in at the, in the morning at six in the morning to do my kidney readings. And if they were no good, they would then put me on a, in an ambulance and send me through to um, Wellington Hospital for my dialysis. Mm. And so what they would have to do, because I was like Kelsey, where I couldn't be touched, like it hurt, like it was painful. I was sucking on the gas every time they touched me, moved me. So to endure all the bumps on the road in an ambulance all the way to Wellington Hospital was horrific. So they would drug me as much as they could to get there um, and then transport me over to the dialysis bed, do the dialysis, which takes all those drugs out of your body, and then I'd go home on nothing. <laughs> and it was horrendous. <laughs> so I did that for um, three weeks, mm. and that was it was not, um, not pleasant at all. Um, but fortunately, and I'm really grateful that the my internal organs are really good and they've all recovered, and... Um, yeah, that's that's been a, a huge thing. Yeah, that's amazing. So for, for those three weeks, you're you're fully conscious and aware of what's going on. And you, can you remember the moment you got told about about the limbs? Yeah, so I actually my reaction to losing my legs went, wasn't that I was okay about that. Yeah, like it didn't. Do you think that's the drugs you were on, or probably? Or just or just because you were so like like beaten and deflated. Yeah, and I think just whatever. so. Yeah, yeah, I think mm. I was just. I think I was just like, oh my god, I'm I'm alive for a start, yeah, okay. and then trying to process actually what had happened. Um, but I was more surprised about my arms and my fingers, and I didn't. But I don't know why that really confused me as to why they needed to take them. And um, but when I see the photos of what they looked like, I completely understand why they had to, because mm. they were literally we were going to fall off otherwise. Yeah, because they were black. So. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably more of a surprise. And then mum would obviously fill me in little by little, by little as to what happened and um, so I could get my head around it slowly. Um, yeah, so you were out of the woods at this stage? Yeah, I would, uh, I would say... So fortunately for me, my grafts took really well. I never had to have any redone. Um, and so I was really lucky in that, in that respect. And they, they think because I was cut into fitness beforehand that I was reasonably healthy going in. So they don't know whether that was a thing or whether I'm just lucky. Um, so, yeah, so over those three weeks, I couldn't wait to get back to Palmerston. Like, I just was over Wellington. Um, and I, I guess it just I needed to go home. Like, that's what I yeah. keep focusing on. Yeah. I was like, I just want to go home. Um, After that, so yeah, so how long are we talking now for hospital? The time you spent in Palmy plus the time you spent in Wellington yeah, and so Lower Yeah, so we're up to a couple of months. Oh, okay, yeah, no wonder yeah. you wanted to get home. Yeah. yeah. of course. Yeah, so, and like no one could come, no one really came to visit because I they weren't, they couldn't because yeah. I was so susceptible to bugs as well. So they had to be very careful about who visited and, and whatnot. So I just had the same kind of rotation of people <laughs> coming. Yeah. Um, which was fine, like, a, and then when I got back to Palmy, I was able to see my friends, which was a big um, positive step in the right direction. But I wasn't released home. I had to go back to the Palmy Hospital. Um, 
And so once they got me all sorted, as far as that's go, then I went to the rehabilitation ward in, in Palmy, which was probably my worst part of the whole experience. Really? Why so? Um, because it's like 70 and 80 year olds that are in there. And here I was at 36. Um, some of the nurses were too scared to touch me, like because of everything that was going on. Um, in the end, the ICU nurses would come oh, sc- over. scared to touch you because you, you'd yelp in pain? All my or? grafting and, yeah. yeah, just like the, the rec- you know, okay. the skin changing and the scabs that were all over my body and, yeah, they just didn't really know how to deal with that. <laughs> they hadn't seen anything <laughs> like lot. it, I yeah, don't yeah, think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was a yeah. lot. Yeah, when you get a, um, yeah, Polytech and Palmerston to become a nurse, you're not expecting this. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and thankfully I had made good friends with the people in the ICU unit and they would come and visit me and yeah. um, and they would make sure I was doing all right. But it got to a point where I was over it. I was so over it and I just wanted to get out. Just frustrated. Yeah. And um, so my friend Kelly that was a nurse, uh, she came and got me for the day. I was allowed to go out on day leave, so she came and got me. And she took me back to her house. And I, So I was in a wheelchair at that point, so that was navigating, trying to get in and out of cars, etc. So from this, that so, position. So, so this is how long after the November when you got sick? So we're talking um, mid-January, end of January. Okay. So it was a shit Christmas that year. Yeah, totally. <laughs> shit you, New Year. <laughs> yeah. Although you did get legless. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't make that joke. You're the only one that should be able to make that yeah, joke. Yeah, no, no, you're fine. Okay, I so, I've heard it all before. Yeah, so <laughs> so we're up to mid-January now, and are you, um, so you're over it. Are you, um, up until this point, like, have you have you been, like, like positive and optimistic, or were yep. you, were you in, you weren't in like a deep depression or anything? No, no. And they were expecting me to do that. Like I'd get the um, people to come in and they were like, how are you doing? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And then, but they were expecting me to say, you know, they're like, it's okay if you're not good. And I'm like, I'm no, I'm, I'm okay. And um, yeah, they, and it was almost like they were expecting me mm. to, to have something, like some sort of reaction, which is probably quite normal. Yeah, did that come at some point? No, no, no. So where where does this come from? Is this the, the is it, is this just your DNA? Is this what you were like beforehand? And you you know you've always been like a just a, a tough, resilient person. Do you think? I think I think probably I am. Like I don't. But you yeah. Need, I mean, regardless of how tough and how resilient you are, like no one ever faces a challenge like that until no. they have to face. That. Yeah, I know, and you don't know how you're going to react, do you? Exactly. So. Yeah. Um, well, that's lucky because that would have been. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was really good. Um, I good think there was a there was a patch probably when I had left hospital and I had started to go back to work, etc. There was a patch where I would get a little bit anxious about going into big situations like big gatherings. Why? And because I would of people staring away. at you, or yeah, I don't know. I think that might have been it. Mm. But I got I got over that. That just didn't last for that long. Mm. Um, but so I do remember that little patch. Yeah. yeah. So at this point, are you in a wheelchair? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you've just got, like, I'm, I'm imagining like bandaged stumps. Yeah. So bandaged stumps, um, and they were really swollen um, because they take a while to, you know, lose mm. the fluid and stuff. Um, and so yeah, in a wheelchair. So of course, my left hand is not that good. So I just went around in circles in a wheelchair. It was hopeless. I couldn't. I couldn't <laughs> propel it at all. Um, okay. So that frustrated so the yeah, hell out of me. You're so frustrated. Yeah. So you needed someone to push you. Yeah. Essentially. Pretty much. Right. So they ended up getting me an electric chair because I couldn't do it by myself. I just literally. I, I would have been useless in a wheelchair basketball team or rugby team like it just was never going to be a thing um and so yeah so um kelly came and got me that day i went back to her house and i said to her i don't want to go back and she's like well, i'll ring them and you can stay the night here and she said we're nurses we've you know we know what we're doing so she rang them and they said yeah that's fine she needs to be back the next day so um kelly had made a big bath and they'd managed to get me into the bath and i did normal things and it was like oh this is amazing you know like and i had a nice sleep in a nice big bed and it was just lovely um so the next day when i woke i said to kelly i'm out i'm not going back and she was like, well, we'll have to go back <laughs> to get you out. And I was like, yeah, okay. So we pulled up to the rehab ward and um, we just started packing up my room. And the nurses come in and go, what's happening? And I'm like, I'm out. I'm leaving. And they're like, 
what? And like they were trying to get their heads around it. And I'm like, I've had enough. I just need to go home. And um, and so they said to me, well, if you discharge yourself, then, um, you know, if you need some more medical assistance in the future, you won't be able to come back to the hospital because you discharge yourself. And I was like, really? That's weird. <laughs> so you're all in or you're all out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Kelly, okay. yeah, Kelly being a nurse basically said, that's a load of bullshit. <laughs> yeah, fake news. Yeah, and uh, so we packed up and, and off we went. And like from that point on, I never looked back. Um, but at that, before I had done that, so probably going back a two weeks before, we had this meeting with all the doctors and all the physios and all everybody. It was a big room full of everyone, and it was me and mum. And so they sort of gave me my diagnosis at that point. So they said to me that I would um, likely be in hospital for 12 months. So we're at three months at this point. So I'd likely be there for 12 months. Um, I probably wouldn't walk again because of the scarring on my legs. They wouldn't cope with the prosthetics. Um, and mm. probably unlikely to go back to work. And I was thinking, well, that's awesome. Yeah, how, how does that conversation go down? Because yeah. you, you mentioned before you were a physically active and physically yeah. fit person prior to this. Um, yeah, what's that moment like? Yeah. Being told you're not going to walk again. Yeah, so I think at the time I was like looking at them as if to say, are you serious? Is, like, the, is the room just spinning? Or Yeah, uh, I was yeah. just like trying to absorb what they were saying. and I was. You burst into tears or what? No, I didn't. I went yeah. the other way. I went, I'll prove it wrong. I'll prove oh you wrong. God. Don't fuck with Penny. Yeah, <laughs> I literally, and I said to mum, that's not going to be my story. Uh. And I said, nah. There's no way that I'm going to... I said, what is the point in surviving if I can't do the things that I want to do? Like, I'm here, I've got two young kids. The choice I need to make is that I've got to live and I've got to find my new normal and be able to make that work for the best way that I can for mm. me and for them. And I was definitely not going to be in hospital for 12 months and I definitely was going to walk again. And there was just no way. And for my own mental state going back to work was the best thing that I could have ever done. Yeah, how long was that? That was quite soon, eh? Six yeah. months? Yeah, six, six months. months. later, so you yeah. went back to the same job. Yeah. How was, how was that? So I was so super lucky. Um, I what, worked, were you, what were you doing, by the way? I was working for User Bus in Palmerston North, the bus company, and um, Justin Allen was the managing director um, and still is, um, and they were amazing. Yeah. So. The building wasn't set up for a wheelchair, so they took down walls, they um, moved shelves, they had a bell in the toilet in case I fell off the toilet when I transferred to, from the from the um, wheelchair to the toilet. Like the girls in the office went well over their job description in helping me, um, so they made my transition so easy, and they just made it work. And I turned up when I could turn up, and I left when I was. Tired. Fatigued, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, there's a lot going on with your body still at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. So um, initially, Justin thought, oh, he'd set me up at home, and then he had a change of heart and said, actually, if you come into the office, at least you're with people, and it's... Um, and it was the best decision. Yeah. It was, and by by sort of two in the afternoon, they could see that the drugs that I was still on were starting to wear in, and so they would they would just call my um, mobility taxi and come and get me, chuck me in there, and away I'd go home and sleep for the afternoon. What, drugs like pain relief or? Yeah. 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 You, you on anything now or no? Nope. No. No. Nope. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Shit, that's good. Uh, yeah, do you just put that down to de determination? Like that speedy recovery and just getting back to trying to figure out what your new normal is? Yeah, I'm pretty tunnel vision. Yeah. Like, I do, and I do, yeah, I guess... Part of me was it was the drive was having young kids, yeah. you know, and and wanting to be a a mum that was still fully involved, um, and then I still had heaps to live for. So I was like, you know, I'm still alive. I've got to, I can either I the way I said it to myself, I got two choices: I could sit and feel sorry for myself, and kind of that be it, or go get go find mm. what my new normal is and and go go and go and take on any challenge that came yeah. along and that's literally what I did. And yeah. if I couldn't work it out, I'd figure a way how to work it out. Oh, how, how, this, is, this is so cool for your kids. What a good role model. Yeah. 
That's they really they cool. think I'm a tough mum, however. Oh, you are. You're a badass. <laughs> you are. And, geez, um, I'm just thinking, if I was a doctor in power, I, I'm, I think I'm a people pleaser by nature. I'd be the worst doctor. I'd be like, no, you, you, you'll be fine. You'll walk. Your legs will probably grow back even. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. I'd probably, like, uh, over-install confidence in people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're... So, so you you have got prosthetic legs now, yeah, um, and you live a, a very active life. This is how I discovered you through your Instagram account, Fitness Hab Amputee, yeah. which we'll get to. Um, so, how did the, how did the leg thing come about after you get, got told you wouldn't walk again? Yeah, so um, about so after that meeting, I went down to the Wellington Limb Centre because it was the local one, and they they looked at my legs and they were ooh and an ring and thinking, what what are we going to do with these? Um, because we, we, of the scarring. Where were they cut? Like a, just, just below bit, the knee. Below the knee, okay. Yeah, so I don't know how yeah. far down. Um, but the scarring was the problem because traditionally with sockets, you've got like a liner on, like a rubber liner in the friction when you walk because you're literally walking in like buckets. Mm. So you're just like sitting in it. And so the friction is quite... A lot, and they thought my skin would break down all the time, which it did. Um, so they ended up getting thicker liners, and I kind of got by with that. Um, but I walked like a robot; like I literally wobbled from side to side, and it was, it was <laughs> like hard. a nineteen seventies robot. Yeah, yeah, and it was hard; like it was hard work. It was exhausting. Um, and yeah, that whole transition was hard. But I did it for six years like that, um, and then I discovered that my I was getting new sockets made all the time because my legs just lose volume over the... So you wake up in the morning where you've been lying horizontal all night. When you stand up, your, your legs are a lot bigger. But by the afternoon of walking in them all day, mine would shrink like mm. enormously. So I was forever getting new legs made and I was getting really frustrated with the system down there. Um, at one point they said to me, oh, there's not much else we can do, so you can either have those legs or you can go back into a wheelchair. And so that kind of, for someone like me to say that, was like not <laughs> yeah, received wrong, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so then I started looking around and I looked over in Aussie and um, I went to Australia looking at, what well, went to a, like a, a expo and I was thinking that I was more looking for the feet Thing to give me more flexibility when I walked rather than being a robot um, because my knees and hips were getting sore because I wasn't walking normally um, so that's what I, my intentions were was to go and find some sort of better feet option when I got there I was looking around and I was talking to one of the brands you know to people mm. and he said to me um, oh, you should go next door and listen to the surgeon that's speaking about osteointegration. And I said, oh, I can't have osteointegration because I'm below knee. And he goes, you're a Kiwi. And I went, yeah, I am. And he goes, that's because you, they don't know in New Zealand that you that it is an option. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I went in. By the way, just pausing you there, that seems absurd. Yeah. That you can be a three-hour flight away and they're all, all – yeah, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's an eye roll moment. Yeah, it is an eye roll moment. And I always felt like the um, limb centres, it was like a secret society almost. Like they didn't give you too much information about stuff. And I've learned so much more about prosthetics with having my connections in Australia since. Mm. Um, so I went and sat in and listened. So it was with um, Pro Pro Professor Munjadel Medeiros. Oh, yeah, big fan of his work. <laughs> <laughs> he's an incredible guy. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Um, so he's got a story of his own. He's a refugee from Iraq oh. and came out on the boats, and so he's got his own book, etc. all about that. Anyway, he was an orthopaedic surgeon, and he always wanted to give back to and make lives easier for um, amputees. So he remembers watching The Terminator as a kid, and thought I could do that for amputees. And it has been around for many, many years, like in Sweden and Germany, mm. but they hadn't quite perfected it the way Munjid has now. Um, and so I was listening to him. He was talking about below knee. I was like, this is okay. This is positive. I'm liking this. And weirdly, after he finished speaking, he came and sat next to me. So it was like it was meant to be. And... Um, I said to him, so you do do below knee? And he goes, yep. 
he goes, that's what I just said because he's got that kind of manner. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And he goes, you're a Kiwi. And I went, yeah. He goes, are you interested? And I said, yeah, I am. He goes, when do you go home? And I said, Tuesday. And he goes, come and see me tomorrow. So this was a wow. Sunday. So I um, – and then the lunch break, his um, – Offsider Belinda came and sat with me and her auntie had died of meningococcal so she kind of resonated with my story and um, so anyway I went out the next day he did all the tests on me bone density scans um, just to make sure that I had strong enough bones for it um, told me the whopping price um, and basically what I needed to do so I needed to go back I needed to go back to one of his clinics um, have some psychological testing to make sure that I was okay that I was an amputee um, that I was going to be okay with a piece of metal hanging out my leg really, oh really what is it like a, a counseling session or is it a quick questionnaire what is it uh, it's a one-on-one -on -one right. with, with a psychologist yeah. and they just ask you random questions about, like about your life um, how it happened, um, what you do currently. So they're trying to assess whether you're hiding away from the real world or whether you're still out there being involved. Um, so I, I passed that, obviously. I was. Did you have to think about the answers? Like, were no. you thinking what would be the correct thing to say here? No. Or you just answered I just answered honestly. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and I met a couple of um, amputees there so I could see the product I could see how they were walking what they were doing and it would blew my mind I was like this is amazing um so it's it is really amazing technology so that it's literally it's a titanium rod that is implanted into the tibia bone for me or the femur for above um through surgical procedures um my rehab was two years um, letting the bone and the implant integrate into each other, um, which is a slow process. Yeah, so what does that two years look like? So that was wheelchair. So you go right back to okay. ground, Groundhog Day. So you have to have your head back in that space. Mm -hmm. So back um, to a wheelchair uh, then once that was kind of around a month and then I was up on legs with two crutches taking most of the weight yeah. so and then um, once you got through that then you dropped one crutch and then you're loading like about 20 percent mm. um, and then you move forward to no crutches and then you just start walking not how's, overdoing it how's that in the beginning is uh, it, what's is, is the balance difficult or is it painful on the on the stumps or the bones? It, weirdly, it's not painful. Yeah. You would think it would be, but it's not. If It uh, it looks painful. Like you, you lifted up your... Actually, do you want to lift up your leg now so we can <laughs> see it on? Only if you want to. I don't mind. Um, it l looks painful. It looks yeah. like it should be painful, but it's not painful at all. No, and, not at all. Um, no. Just for the people that, that are watching this on YouTube, for anyone that's um, listening to the audio version, you won't see this. So that's that stays on. By the way, cool new balance shoes. I know, by the aren't way. they cool? Yeah. So what bit comes off? So, um, so this part that's closest to my leg yep. is in me permanently, and there is an use an Allen key, and I take from there off mm. down. So when when you go to bed at night, what do you? Some people leave them on. Yeah. I don't. I take my legs off. Yeah. You've never had a thing where you've you've woken up and you've forgotten and tried to get it? No. 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 Wow, that is um yeah. that is amazing technology, isn't it's it? It's incredible. There's a lot going yeah. on. Yeah, um, but the the coolest thing about it is that for me, because I was only an amputee six month, uh, six years before having the surgery, I, it's reconnected all my wires, and so I can feel the ground, the concrete, the grass. It's just, can you? Yeah. How? Yeah, it's amazing. Holy, that's incredible. Yeah, and that's something they didn't know was going to happen with the surgery, and it's just over the um, time. So if you were born an amputee, like, you, you know, you don't have that connection. Yeah. So that doesn't happen. But the, the least time that you have been in a socket before you go to osteointegration, generally people are feeling yeah. the differences. And, and what about phantom pains? I don't get it. I've yeah. been fortunate. I... I I've been really fortunate. Mm. I did have it at, right at the very beginning, and it's excruciating and horrible. Um, but yeah, I'm really I'm one of the really lucky ones. Yeah. I do take magnesium, and I'm religious with magnesium. Um, and I have done it from as soon as I got the surgery. Um, Munjit had said start taking magnesium, and I take it religiously every night. And I don't know whether that helps um, or not, but 
I've always been really active, so I don't know. I just some people it's really horrible, but mm. I'm I've been lucky that that hasn't affected me. Yeah, shit, you're remarkable, aren't you? You 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 really are. Like men and Jada's picked the wrong person. Yeah, I know. It really did. Shit, you're tough. Yeah. You, I suppose times like this, you find out just how fucking tough you are. Yeah, yeah. People say that, like they always say, you know, you're one strong lady or whatever, and it's like, yeah. I guess I am. I don't really think about it. I just do what I want to do mm. and make sure that I'm doing it the best way that I can. And having this surgery, so while having to go all the way back, so I did have to learn to walk again because the wobbling that I was doing in the sockets wasn't how this was going to work with the implant. So the implant is aligned, like laser aligned, so that you're completely 100% in line with your legs. And... Um, so I had to learn. I had to go right back to the beginning, and I'd how, lost that thought. How hard is that to, to be like a 36, 37-year-old learning to walk again? Yeah, it was weird. Like, it was rewarding because I was taking my first steps again in this new system. Frustrating as well because I just wanted to go. Um, and I had to be patient. I'm not the most patient person in the world. <laughs> um, and being patient, I had to learn that really a lot because I had to wait for a few mm. years before I could actually start doing what I could really wanted to do. Um, Which was so, like exercise and yeah, fitness getting, and weight. Yeah, and yeah. just keeping up with day-to-day. -day. Like, you know, like generally in a socket, I would if I was invited somewhere, I would have to think about the access. I would have to think about how I was going to get in and out. Um, was the ground going to be slippery? Was it, you know, all those things would run through my head in preparation of going anywhere. Now I don't even think about it. Mm. I just do it. I can walk up the hills in Wellington. I can, I just do life, like, to the fullest. And I can yeah. keep up with all my family, my friends. Um, yeah. And how much was that operation? You said it, you said it cost, what? <laughs> You want to go there or do you want to go there? No, I just remembered you said before it cost a shit ton of money. It did, it did cost a it shit not ton covered, of money. Not covered by any sort of insurance or... No. Did you set up a give a little or anything like that? I did. Um, uh, we did do some crowdfunding and that, that definitely helped. Um, do you, if, you don't, if you don't want to answer, you don't have to answer. But. Well, it's a, it's a really good size deposit on a house. Oh, my God. Yeah. But, yeah. But n necessary for your qu the quality of life you've got. I'd now, never so go back. Like Money well spent. Yeah, it was money well spent. And I was really fortunate. Like, uh, Munja was really uh, very, very giving for me because I was his first Kiwi and first manager cockle patient. Um, he kind of gave me a pretty discounted rate. So he contributed a lot to, to um, my surgery as well. So I was really super lucky with that. Um, then some crowdfunding and then, um, yeah, paid the rest, lived on spaghetti for a while. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so we got there in the end. Um, and I'm, I, for quality of life, it's, it's money well spent. Mm. I would never not have it now. It's not for everybody, for sure. Um, and it seems to be that people that have, are not healthy on the inside don't always respond that well to osteointegration. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you kind of got to. You have to keep yourself healthy. Mm. Yeah. yeah. With it, with the, I mean, we've established that you're you're strong and you're resilient and and very very tough. But there there must have been some like, just I don't know, awful days or awful moments. We just frustration gets the better of you. Yeah, they generally happened at the limb centre. <laughs> <laughs> just out of really, frustration. Yeah, it was really yeah. frustrating. Um, that whole socket journey, I hated. I really did. It was. I found it really restricting mm. um, and super frustrating. And that was probably, yeah, that was that was tough because it just it didn't work for me. Um, and my quality of life was nowhere near what it is now mm. uh, with those sockets. Um, and, yeah, I guess there were times, you know, like when the kids were going on school camp and things like that, and I would have loved to have been a parent help, but yeah. physically that wasn't something I could do at that time. So, yeah, I had to kind of suck those kind of situations up and just so Just feel sorry for yourself for a brief period of time and then yeah, snap and then yourself out of it? Yeah, and then just move out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I don't tend to dwell on it. I Like, I just want to... Mm. enjoy the life that I've got yeah. how, how, how can other people um, take some of that take some of that magic juice <laughs> like what would mm. you what would your message be or uh, 
like it, you know, maybe it's just part of your your DNA and and who you are and your personality. But there's got to be takeaways for other people that you know go through shit about how they can deal with it and make them make yeah. the best of a bad situation. What do you reckon? Yeah, they, yeah. What's your advice? Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I guess like on one side, you've got to want to do it. Yeah. Like you've you really you have to dig deep. Like I had to dig deep so many times to push you to get, keep going. Um, so yeah, you gotta you gotta want to do it and just never give up. Like I don't give up. I just if I can't do something, I'll figure out a way how to do it. Or if it's not quite now, it's something I can work towards in the future to make that happen. So there were plenty of over the seven years. There was plenty of those kind of situations where I can't quite do that now, but then in a year's time I could do it if I just keep chipping mm. away. Um, keeping you, healthy is is, yeah. is a big thing. Like what you feed and fuel your body is just so much helps with everyday life, I reckon. So yeah, was that, was that a cornerstone of your life before the meningitis? Not as, ma- it, not, yeah, not as much yeah. as a focus. Like I have a lot, like I... Dr- eat and drink a lot of protein um, and that's because it feeds my bones yeah. and helps with my legs. So um, I have a really quite a high protein diet and water, I just drink an enormous amount of it because I need to keep flushing my kidneys and keep all those internal organs ticking over. So um, it is quite a focus for yeah. me. I, yeah. I, I drink a lot of water as well, but I'll tell you what, I'm not um, urinating just a teaspoon of wee. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more than that coming out more yeah. frequently as yeah, well. Yeah, me too now. Yeah. 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 So the um, the Instagram account, um, the Fitness Amputee, by the way, you should have way more followers than what you do have. Uh, <laughs> it seems astonishing to me because, uh, you know, you're, you're um, remarkable and it's inspiring. And all these th- and motivating, um, yeah. so it should have more followers. So hopefully we can boost that up a little bit. But when when did you decide to do that and set that up and sort of become your yeah, public? I guess with your like recovery and your progress and your journey. Yeah, I guess. Um, so once I'd gone through the rehab and I was coming out the other side, that's when when generally walking was becoming easy, and I could walk a distance and not you know have any inkling of any pain or anything like that like pain in the sense that I've overdone it so once that was becoming normal that's when I thought "Mm." so I got a bike like just an exercise bike because I used to do spin classes and that was my favorite thing and I thought oh maybe I could try that biking's not putting too much pressure on my implant etc yeah Yeah. so I started biking and then it kind of just grew from there um and I did I did my first challenge, like a fitness challenge, with Shane Hunter in Palmerston North, who is a bodybuilder, um, and he did uh, this challenge on a on a um, just as a for his friends and family really, and um, so I did that, and I was surprised at what I could do, and by no means what I, was I doing what I'm doing now, but it was my start of of that whole journey. And then I really enjoyed the challenge aspect. So I liked that period of time and having, because I'm kind of driven by time, like with, you know, um, an eight-week challenge is like, okay, I've got eight weeks to do this and see the improvements along the way. And I started videoing myself because I could see what I was doing then. And it was more for my own benefit. It was like, oh, God, what the hell are you doing there? Like, that looks really odd. Or you need, <laughs> you need to do this better or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so f- after that challenge had finished, I went looking for the next challenge and I signed up with these girls from Australia. It was called Move With Us. And I was with them for three years and became one of their ambassadors um, because they were amazed by what I could do too. And so I was just starting again with challenges. And I literally just for three years went from challenge to challenge, all different ones. Some were Pilates, some were like glute work, some was all over. It was just depending what they what was happening. And I loved it. And I just started connecting with other people. Um, one of my friends in Australia who's also an amputee, um, Linda, she does them too. So her and I were like kind of sidekicks together doing it. Um, and then recently, so where I got quite a 
bit of my growth was with a girl in Hamilton, um, which was um, Elevate, and that was with um, Nick. And she, I saw the most amount of growth in my time with her eight week challenge. Yeah. Um, and she, she, she knew my limitations and also would try and tweak the program a little bit for me. Um, but yeah, I grew so much strength in that eight weeks um, to now feeling like I'm stronger than I was before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, which leads me to, to this question, which is um, probably a very, I don't, I don't know if it's an inappropriate question, it's probably a very difficult one to answer, but if you could go back to 2009 and choose to have the, the, men, the meningitis and everything that's come or not have it, bear in mind all the bad stuff that's happened, all the good stuff that's happened as well, um, would you change it? Would you change anything? Um. Probably, I think the reason I get emotional when I talk about it is because of what everyone else went through, not necessarily what I went through. And so when I think about that time yeah. way back, it's about um, my mum and my dad and, you know, the kids and all that and ev- what everyone went through. And that's what makes me emotional more yeah. than what I went through. Like, I just think, God, it must have been heart-wrenching for them to sit there and see that happening. Um <clears throat> But as far as your question goes, I think it's made me the person I am now. Mm. And the journey, I look at life so differently. Yeah. And God, that's I, such an unselfish answer. Yeah. And I just, I don't know, I mm. kind of seize the moment now. Like, where I don't often say no to things. Like, I, I like to do stuff with people. Um, and I just look at, I just look at life differently. And I just think, you know, let's do it. Like, mm. why not? So, yeah. Yeah, just reflecting on that period, like you, you just can't imagine. Have you? I'm guessing you've had numerous conversations with your mum or your parents about it. That must have been just um, just the stuff of nightmares. I know. Just that period. Yeah. Well, you were blissfully out of it. You were yeah. on morphine or whatever. Yeah, I was, I yeah, was yeah. asleep. I had no idea what they were going through. I know, oh. like, my mum and my brother and all of them, like, they literally took over the waiting room in ICU and they, mm. they slept there for days on end. Um, because they just never knew. Like, Mum said she just couldn't leave me, like, because she didn't know if I was going to still be there the next day. So she just couldn't take herself away. So it would have, um, oh, it would have been horrendous. Yeah, and then, and then there's other admin to deal with, like, the, you know, the coming up with the narrative that they're going to tell the kids, mm. <laughs> you know, because you can't feed the kids too much information. And you, No, yeah. Man. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's... And, and it's interesting, but yeah, I, I, it has definitely shaped who I am, and mm. um, I, it is what it is for me now, and I don't hide my legs like in the in the summertime. I wear shorts. Everybody stares um, at me, and I'm just used to just blocking mm. it out. Um, kids are hilarious because they're like, "Oh my god, <laughs> oh, no filter! You're a robot." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, how how long was it um, that you were? I mean, you came in here today wearing, wearing long pants, and you 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 don't walk like a robot. You just walk normally, so yeah. there's no way of knowing. But um, your your hands are definitely messed up. Yeah. How how long were you self conscious of them? Did you find yourself sort of tucking them under your armpits? I probably initially, or? still do that. Do you? Yeah, I think yeah. I still do that with my hands. What can, can you just sense? People staring, or you you fear they're going to stare, or yeah, I think it's become a, a real habit to pop my left hand in my pocket, majority of the time, or under my arm. Um, I don't know. I just think it's become a thing. Yeah. With it, and now I do it without even realizing I'm doing it. Mm. Um, but when I'm at work, like I'm typing away, and I can type and carry on, like it's not, I'm not limited in that regard. Um, but it's yeah, I don't know. It's just something I do tuck away, but with my legs, I'm just like, oh, it's what- yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and have you had any therapy or counselling over the years, or just the, those sessions before you had the operation? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. it. That's it. Man, you're a tough I cookie. I know. I know. Jeez, when uh, you think about it now, isn't it like you know? I don't know. I suppose with your with your kids, you just mum. So maybe it's not not a sort of conversation that you really have. But have, have you sat down with them and you know like talked about things in sort of depth or detail? Yeah, they they know everything. Yeah. yeah, they know how it was. They know that I, you know, nearly died. Um, are they at an age now where they can sort of like a, a, appreciate just how remarkable you are? Well, not really. You're just mum. You're a pain I think in the I'm ass. Just, I think <laughs> I'm just mum. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
they don't. I mean, like Jade was three and Sam was seven, so the majority of their life, I've been this way. Yeah. So um, they don't. Yeah, they don't. It just doesn't. And all of their friends that come and go at home, they all know the story. Um, they they just accept me for who I am, mm. and yeah, it's never. It's just never a problem. Oh no, no, I don't. I don't mean like that. I just, I just I, I'm, I'm thinking from a point of being in awe of you as their as their mum, and I feel like as they maybe as they get older and they get a bit more, um, uh, you know, aware of the world around them and things, they'll they'll become more like uh, more, more more of a fan of you, I guess, and what you've done, and hopefully like listening to a conversation like this yeah. will make them realise like you've you've been through a lot and you've done it with a smile on your face and you've grit your teeth and yeah, you know you haven't you, you know you haven't given up on yourself or on them. No, it's it's, it's cool. Yeah, and I guess they they're probably the driving force too mm. because you know like they they we had to adapt and learn from a young age how to replay you know, spend time with them because I couldn't get down on the floor with them. So we would have little tables and we'd work out different things that we could do as opposed to running outside and, you know, mucking around because yeah. it wasn't something I could do. So we just relearned what we could do together at those times and then they've just grown with me at each stage that I've gone. And now they don't even, they don't see it. They don't see that I'm an amputee. Because it just is what it is. Mm. And that, yeah, they don't. And when people say to them, Oh, is your mum an amputee? They're like, Oh, yeah. And that's all they say. Yeah, but I suppose there's, n- there's nothing that you can't do, though. There isn't now. Yeah. No, now there's no, I don't have any limitations at all. Um, yeah. So I just, so they, they don't see that either. Um, if anything, they always laugh and say that when they're sick, they're not sick in my eyes because they're not really that sick. Mm. And they're like, man, you're so tough, like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, are they, are they the same as you? Or, like, are they, are they quite um, quite tough cookies? I've had to make them that way yeah. in some ways <laughs> because I don't let them have days off school just because. Oh, God, you wanna, you're like my mum. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but that, my, that was in the 1980s. It was different back then. Yeah, I was no. Very, uh, yeah, so I remember Jade, and she still remembers it. Like, her toe, she had a sore toe, and she kept going on about it. And I'm like, you'll be right, you'll be right. <laughs> Must and be nice to have toe. Yeah, and then a week later it's like fully infected and it's like, okay, we better go to the doctor. And she's like, geez, mum. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, you know. I should have listened more. It's not that yeah. bad. Like, yeah, I keep yeah. thinking could it's not worse. that bad. It could be worse. Yeah. Yeah. So they've kind of had to suck it up a lot. So, yeah, I guess they are probably quite tough cookies in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good stuff. Mm. And and um, how long how long was it after um, losing the limbs that you that you dreamed yourself without limbs? Does that make sense? I've, I've had um, I've had numerous um, numerous people on the podcast. Um, Rachel Meyer and Liam Malone, a couple of amputees, mm-hmm. and uh, Brad Smaler, and another guy called um, Kerry Suter, who um, went from being able able bodied to being you know, quadriplegics overnight. And there's a theory that um, that when you start dreaming yourself as an amputee, as in how you are, that's when you've truly come to accept it. Oh, okay. Haven't heard that before. Haven't you? No. Yeah. No. Secret society. They don't yeah, tell you this stuff. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever had that th- thought. Yeah. No. Nah. Interesting. It's just, yeah. I mean, sometimes I still get that, that se- like, and you, it's weird what, you, what the brain does. Like, I might have an itchy toe and I reach down to scratch my toe and it's not even there. Mm. But you have that sensation, like that happens a lot. That's kind of like the, wow. that phantom thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you can feel, like the other day I walked to work in the rain and I felt like my feet were wet all day. And they probably were, but I shouldn't be able to feel that, but I could. That's so interesting. Yeah. 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 So how old are you now? What are you? 40, 49, 50? Come on. <laughs> well, 51. No. 48. 49. Yeah. 49. It's that big one this year. Why? Oh, is it? Yeah. What are you doing? I don't know. Not accepting that very well. Oh, really? No. Why? I don't really, I don't really want to turn 50. Oh, come on. Grow up. Ages. I know you already have. Yeah, I, in February. <laughs> I, and I, I must admit, I didn't have a big party. I just had like a quiet dinner, par- dinner party. I was like, I just want to let it go. But um, it should be something that's celebrated. Yeah, I know. Especially with what you've been through. Yeah. 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 And the second half of your life, how's that going to look? What do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? Um, 
At the moment, I am working, um, so I'm a contractor, so kind of working for myself in, in uh, lots of ways, but I'm working for Stats New Zealand in the uh, payroll team, so that's been my bread and butter, literally, is payroll. Um, so I'm pretty busy in there at the moment. Um, I'd love to work with amputees at some stage, just to show them that what is possible and what you can do, um, whether that is alongside Munjid at some point or or what, I have no idea what that would be. But that is something that irks away at me about I'd love mm. to be able to do something along those lines just yeah. to help others carry on with their life when something like this has happened. Um, yeah, and literally... Yeah, just that other half, isn't it, from 50, the other half of your life? <laughs> <laughs> well, I recorded a podcast this morning with um with a guy called Arch Jelly, who used to be the coach of um, John Walker, and he's he turns 101 in a couple of months. Wow. And he's fit, and he's healthy, and he's vibrant, and he's, he's uh, mentally sharp. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, you, you and I, we shouldn't be winding down the clock. We should be just getting started. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And I do look at it like that too. Like I just think I've got heaps to, you know, there's heaps of life left to live, isn't mm. there? And I'm lucky I'm still here. So, yeah. and I'm healthy. So, you know, I can do whatever, really. Oh, 100%. So, 100%. 100%. You should be getting your story out there as much as what you can because you're, um, how do you feel being called inspiring? Does it sit comfortably with you or? Some people feel real weird about it. It is a bit weird. Is that? Because you don't really. Um, I don't see myself like that. Yeah, but I suppose yeah. you've, you've been through a big thing and no one knows how they're going to react until they're, they're faced with that big thing. Yeah. And you've um, you faced it with uh, courage and grace and dignity. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that makes you inspiring. Yeah, yeah. People do use that a lot, yeah. And, and strong is the other word yeah. that they use a lot. But, um, yeah, I guess my kids are, well, Sam's 20, he's about to head off overseas. Um, and Jade's 17, so she's only got one more year left at work, uh, at school. So they're about to, I'm probably more unhappy about that, to be fair. <laughs> that they're, they're starting to go off and live their own lives. And it's like, oh. oh you don't need me anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That kind yeah. of, that's a bit sad. That's kind of a, yeah, that's, I suppose that's a, in its own sort of way, a sense of loss. Yeah, it's weird. Like, a, yeah, it is, it is kind of, it's like, oh, it's all happening at once and I'm turning 50 at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You've survived meningitis. You can survive this. You've got this. I believe in you. Hey, Penny Taylor, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. No problem. I really appreciate it. And really nice to reconnect again. I know. Funny, isn't it? It's a small world. It really is. <laughs>